this video deals with reservations in two-way slabs by means of yield lines. We will handle case one, and uh, I will explain what case one uh, is about. We have a rectangular uh, slab simply supported on the four sides. It's a two-way slab. It means that the dimension B will be between A and 2A. If B is bigger than 2A, then we have a slab which is only uh, carrying the load in this vertical direction. Then now we will make a reservation or a hole in the slab. And the position of the hole is D3 and D4. And the uh, two dimensions of the hole are V1 and D2. The green one are the yield lines of the slab without uh, a reservation in it. So we will assume that for this type of reservation, the original yield lines stay the same, but where the reservation is, the yield lines are uh, uh, not there. They are not there. But we will see later on that you can also have other yield line patterns. That is when D4 or D3 are very small or are smaller, then the uh, corners of the uh, reservation can track the yield lines. And then you will have a different yield line pattern. But we will see about that in the next videos. First, we will look at the conditions uh, of the position of this uh, reservation in the slab. The horizontal position, we will say that this slab of this uh, reservation will go maximum to there, to this side, and maximum this side is maximum here. So why, why are we doing that? So we will show you in, in a picture what this means. So this reservation is moving from there to there. This is what it says by this uh, inequality. We do that because uh, every time when, the, when the, the reservation is on a different place, your yield lines are different, and you cannot make one simple formula for all possible reservations in the slab. So we. That's why we have case one to case uh, five, just by uh, uh, making for each possible location of a reservation a uh, formulation of the maximum bending moment. Of course, D4 is now must be smaller than A over two. It means that this reservation must not go further on than this point there. The vertical position for this type of reservation, we will uh, uh, say that this corner will always be within this triangle. So it will only cut this field line. And then we have a vertical symmetry. And the vertical symmetry, to make it easy, means that just this reservation is in the middle of the shortest uh, size of the slab. So A over 2 or D3 is of course a minus d1 divided by 2. So now let's have, have a look at some possibilities. So these are all the conditions that we attach to case 1. And you will see that the reservation can go from this. So the yellow portion is a reservation. Within the reservation, the yield lines do not exist. You can see that all those reservations are possible within those conditions here. This is also uh, possible. And then you will see that, for instance, on the left-hand side, it's always within this triangle. And on the right-hand side, it's never passing through in the second triangle. So now you have the different pos possible positions for this case one type of holes. When we look at the... Uh, general uh, form of it, then you will see that we can divide the slab into rectangulars and, tri and, and triangles uh, for calculating the work done by the external forces. 
here you have one triangle then there's the next so the green ones are all the triangles and the orange ones are the rectangulars the mean displacement of the triangle was the maximum displacement divided by three and for the rectangular slab was divided by two so you have two terms one divided by three and the other term is one divided by one over two so then it's it's easy we can have uh, uh, on, on this, this side you have a times a over two as a total surface so instead of doing it triangle by triangle we make it our life easy we just take the total uh, surface of the slab multiplied by the load and then uh, uh, multiplied by one third of the maximum deflection because we have in fact an accumulation of triangles that's what's stated here now we come to those uh, uh, triangles now you will see that when this line here has a as a uh, deflection of, of uh, uh, delta then you will see if we take for instance from here to here we cut in the slab this is the slab this is the size a over two the maximum was uh, delta and now we are at a distance d3 so at the distance 3 d3 you have the deflection uh, delta x and or delta one and then you you will see that the delta x is equal to or proportional because of this triangle to d3 times uh, divided by a over two so this is the maximum deflection that you get from this triangle why because we need a mechanism so this is theta uh, delta sorry we push this down and then you will see this is less uh, this displacement so that's why we got for the those uh, smaller triangles it's the surface of it and then multiplied by t3 uh, theta uh, delta times 2 over a so this is what you stated here then we do the same for the uh, rectangular uh, portions it is the uh, size a times the distance the total distance minus d4 which is this one minus d2 minus a over 2 so this portion here is equal to that then we uh, uh, multiply or we add up to that the uh, triangle the rectangles here and you will see again that the rotation or the the mean uh, deflection of the slab is uh, calculated uh, in relation or in ratio with the maximum uh, delta so we we divide by q over over delta because it, it's easier and it, it's just uh, easy to to make the notation like that and delta you can suppose this is one it does not uh, play any role because the delta disappears when you are going to make e equal to d so then we can write that in a simple way and we have this uh, configuration for the uh, work done by the internal bending moments we now look at the yield lines and then you will see that uh, the yield line uh, for d3 it's this yield line rejected to the rotation axis of here so you got d3 times uh, uh, the total angle uh, that this slab rotated is always the most extreme fiber which is a over two and in fact it is delta divided by a over two which is the tangus of the angle but but with small angles you have just uh, delta divided by a over two and we have got that four times because you project it on this axis we project it on this axis and then this piece portion also on this axis and all on this axis so that's what this term is about then the other uh, portion is this line again we have the total length of this line 
times the rotation angle, which is two, which is one divided by a over two, but we got that twice because you have to project it on this rotation x and you have to project this on this rotation axis. And then we have this uh, line projected downwards to this rotation axis, then it will be uh, a over two, which is a over two times the maximum rotation, which is delta divided by a over two. And we got that two times this and this way. And then we do exactly the same for this uh, yield line, but projected on the this uh, uh, edge. Can write it a bit more simple. And then we get from E equals G, we get M. And this is M, the maximum bending moment for this case one type of uh, hole in the slab. Let's just now make a simple example, then you will see what you can do with it. We got a rectangular slab, and the depth of the slab is 150 millimeters. The concrete cover is 25 millimeters. The fourth finish is 2 kilonewton per square meter. The mobile load is 4 kilonewton per square meter. And we want to know what is the needed reinforcement. Well, we start with calculating the so load in ULS, which is, of course, the proper weight times 1.35 plus 1.5 times the mobile load. And it gives you 13.76 kilonewton per square meter. Then for uh, this uh, uh, reservation in this lab, we can just simply uh, uh, apply the formula that we've seen in the previous slide. You fill in all the different uh, parameters and we have 19 kilonewton meter per meter. Then we look at the lever arm in the X direction. It's the total depth minus the concrete cover minus the diameter of the reinforcement divided by two. And uh, we don't know yet, but uh, we will try. Uh, out of experience, uh, you see this is not very high, this, this uh, bending moment. The slab is 150 millimeters, so we estimate it's a diameter eight. But it doesn't matter because if this uh, diameter is wrong, then we redo the calculations with the correct diameter. So we take eight. And then you see the lever arm in the X direction is 121 millimeters. In the Y direction, it's in the second layer of reinforcement. And we assume or, or, or from the beginning that the reinforcement in X and Y is the same. So we have 113 millimeters. And then we take the mean lever arm in both directions. The mean lever arm is then 117 millimeters. Now we can redo all calculations and assume that the M, the bending moment, is different in the X direction than in the Y direction. And the, the difference will be the proportional to the lever arms. But you can also take a mean lever arm, which is valid, more or less valid uh, for the X and the Y direction. It's much easier. Then the needed reinforcement in the X and Y direction is the bending moment divided by the lever arm and the yield strength of the reinforcement. And we add 10% because it's an upper bound method. We fill in the uh, numbers and you have, you obtain 458 square millimeter per meter or uh, a diameter eight, every 100 millimeters uh, will, uh, will be okay. So the reinforcement is a mesh of a diameter eight every, uh, 100 millimeters. And the second example, um, when you have now an existing slab and it's reinforced in uh, two directions, we know that, and we, we assume it's uh, the reinforcement is uh, okay for the load on the slab. And now they ask you, can we make a reservation in this slab? for instance, uh, a hole for conduct or something like that, with a dimension 3.6 by three meters. But we don't know what is the reinforcement and we don't know what is the uh, load of the slab, the design load of the slab, we don't know that. So how can we tackle this? Well, 
the maximum bending load without a hole, or the maximum bending moment, sorry, without a hole, uh, you, you, we can uh, make this calculation with the yield lines like we've seen in a previous slide. Then you obtain that the maximum bending moment without the hole is equal to this uh, uh, formula. We don't know the load Q, so we divide M0 divided by Q. Then we have this formula. We fill in the parameters and we have 2.1 meter by meter. Okay. Now we look at the bending moments with the hole. We have our formula that we have just developed a few slides ago, and we have 1.89. And then it's easy. It means that by making this hole, you have a loss of bearing capacity of 10%. So that's an interesting thing to know. So without knowing what is the actual load on, on, on the slab, you can say that if you make a slab like that in this position, and reinforcement in X and Y are equal, and it's properly reinforced, then you lose 10% of your bearing capacity. Now, the bearing capacity is uh, 100 times, I, I make the definition like that, it's 100 times the maximum bending moment without the hole divided by the maximum bending moment with the hole. And so the bearing capacity in our case one is a function of those six variables. Or you can write it like this. Now, we know that there are certain conditions on D1, D2, D3, D4, and so on. And we will work with dimensionless uh, uh, yeah. parameters. So it means that uh, DY uh, will be is equal to uh, A times uh, alpha Y. So we divide every dimension by A and A is the smallest dimension of the slab. In, so the width, uh, the length of the slab is also, is alpha times the width of the slab. Of the slab. This is because the slab, the hole is in the center, uh, is centralized uh, vertically on the slab, so D3 is fixed. Or you can say alpha 3 because we divide by alpha, divide by A, divide by A, and this is also divided by A. So we have alpha 3 is a half minus alpha 1 divided by 2. So for this uh, case 1 type of holes, we take all the restrictions that uh, were imposed from the beginning. And then we can calculate this formula by just using the formulas for M with the hole and M0 without the hole, and we arrive at this uh, formula, which has no dimensions at all. You can make a graph of it. On the y-axis, it's the bearing capacity. On the x-axis, it's the uh, smallest dimension of the reservation in the slab. It's D1 divided by A. And then something peculiar happens. If we make now different graphs of the bearing capacity in function of the smallest dimension of the reservation, and this is, for instance, done for a slab, which is uh, the length two times the width, then you see that for different and different uh, uh, largest dimensions of the whole, we have different curves doing like that. 100, that means that's that's the same capacity. So when you arrive here, for instance, there, and you're at that 100%, it means that the uh, bearing capacity of the flap has not changed. Below 100, it means that you have less bearing capacity if you make the hole. Above 100, it means you increase, in fact, the bearing capacity by making a hole in it. Then we look now when alpha 1 is 0.9 times A, and D1 is 0.9 times A, and we are situated here on the red curve, which means this situation. We can now picture it. And this situation is when you have a hole like that, because alpha 4 is 0, it's, again, it's to the corner. And uh, alpha is 2, that means that this side is twice this size. 
that is 2, and 0.9, it means this is the largest dimension of the whole, that's 0.9 times a, you see there is a small portion here and there, and you see that the smallest dimension is 0.5a, which means this is the big hole in the slab. And then you see the bearing capacity now is 87, which is this point here. So this is the red curve, and this is there, the 87. So you lose 13% of the bearing capacity. We take now another point, for instance, on the black curve. On the black curve, the hole is like this, and we have a bearing capacity of 105. It means that you have taken so much material away from the slab that what is left can take more load than what was previous without the reservation. Now we can go to the left-hand side, this point. You will see there's a total other type of, of uh, configuration. Al alpha is two, means this is twice this distance that we know. Alpha four, which is this side here, is zero. And then we have a very small hole of 0.1, or very small, a relatively small 0.1 times one, which is the dimension of A. So in this reservation, when we do that, you make, you, you make this, for instance, for uh, your uh, utilities or something like that, then you reduce the capacity of the total slab by 12%. Uh, you only have 88% of the original bearing capacity. The next point there, when you make a hole like that, you do not change the bearing capacity of the slab. So this is allowed. So you can, you can make a hole like that. And when you do not cross really the yield lines, you do not touch the bearing capacity of the slab. Of course, if you make a reservation like that, we assume that the reinforcement is sufficiently anchored uh, when the reinforcement is cut. Huh? So we, we, we make the assumption that there is enough uh, uh, anchoring of the reinforcement. Now we see that there is a special point where all curves come through it. And this point is peculiar, but it means that for each slab, there is a specific width, alpha one, the smallest dimension of the slab. So for each slab, there is a specific width of hole where the bearing capacity of the slab is independent of the length of the hole. So if you make for type one, for, for the case one, a hole in the slab with a smallest dimension equals to, let's say, 0.35 times the smallest dimension of the slab, then you can make it as long as, as, as you like. You will not change the bearing capacity. It will, it will be like that. So this is something peculiar. Now let's, let's isolate one curve, which is the black curve on the previous slides. Uh, instead of drawing all those different curves, I only took one to explain something. We fill in the parameters that we have with the uh, uh, black curve, and then you arrive at this equation. Now, 100 means when the bearing capacity is 100, it means 100% of the original bearing capacity, so it's not changed. Below that, there is a decrease in bearing capacity, and above, it's an increase in bearing capacity. Now, you will see that, uh, uh, for instance, for a, ho a reservation in the slab with the smallest dimension, half of the smallest dimension of the slab, so you arrive at 105 bearing capacity. It means that uh, if you take this point here, and we say, well, it's more or less one third, that for every hole bigger than one third of the smallest dimension of the slab, you will have an increase in bearing capacity and otherwise you will have a decrease in bearing capacity. Let's look at the extremes. When alpha one is one, then you have this type of reservation in the slab and the, this slab can take exactly the same load as the previous slab, as the original slab without the hole. We look at the other side when alpha one is zero, that means there's no hole in it. 
but we do not achieve 100% of the bearing capacity, which is at first sight wrong. It's not wrong because it's a question of the extreme values of D1 and D2. You must be, be careful for that. So now we have said D2 is zero. Uh, or or uh, B1 is here, so and then you still have D2, which is from there to there. So this is a cut because there's a cut in the slab. You have less bearing capacity. So if you want to uh, calculate the bearing capacity without the hole, then you should be careful. So what you do is you make a very small hole there. You see the, the small yellow dot. It's a very small hole. It's it's a uh, uh, with D1 and D2 uh, uh, very uh, small. It's, it's something like 0 0.001. If you do that, then this will not affect the bearing capacity of your slab, which is 100%. Um, now, we have an interesting point is uh, when you look at the previous graph, then this point where the bearing capacity is 100%, that's an interesting point because now you know, then you know uh, if you make a hole smaller than this uh, value, then I will lose in bearing capacity. And if it's bigger than this value, I will uh, be safe to make the hole or the reservation in the slab. So to obtain this point, it's just the, we are now going to take a special case where alpha one is one. That means it's a goal, uh, a hole in the slab with the, uh, a dimension uh, equal to the smallest dimension of the slab itself. So when in this formula of the bearing capacity, we fill in alpha one is one and alpha four is zero, then we obtain this equation. And when we put it equal to 100, then you will obtain this point there. Then you will see if you solve this, this is possible for the uh, dimension of the reservation equals to uh, the smallest size, uh, no, equals to B over two. Uh, alpha is B over A, huh? so it's alpha over two. Just to 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 make it more uh, visible, you have a slab. This is the uh, size of the reservation. It's one, so it's equal to the smallest dimension of the slab. This is the other dimension of the uh, uh, of, of the reservation, which is P over two. It's this one. Then you will see if you do that, then the bearing capacity is 100%. So you did not touch at the capacity of the slab by making a hole this size. If you now make a hole which is smaller than this size, like this, then you lose bearing capacity. And if you make a hole bigger than half, then there is no problem at all because you are in this section of the curve. 